Welcome to this presentation. This will be a lecture on disorders of alcohol misuse. We shall be covering the following in this lecture. And we'll be finishing the presentation with a set of five multiple choice questions based on the material covered. Some information about myself. I am a consultant psychiatrist based in Chennai, a city in southern India. I have worked for many years in the United Kingdom. Alcohol is an organic compound containing one or more hydroxyl groups attached to a carbon atom. The word alcohol is derived from Arabic alcohol. In common usage, the term alcohol refers to ethanol or ethyl alcohol, although there are numerous other types of alcohol. Ethanol is the intoxicating ingredient of drinks such as beer, wine, spirits, etc. The chemical formula of ethanol is C2H5OH. And this is the chemical structure of ethanol. One unit of alcohol contains 8 grams or 10 ml of pure alcohol. The formula to calculate the number of units in a particular drink is volume in ml multiplied by ABV in percentage divided by 1000, where ABV stands for alcohol by volume and is a measure of alcohol content in a drink expressed as a percentage. For example, the number of units in 500 ml of beer with 4% ABV will be 500 into 4 divided by 1000, which gives us 2 units. And these are some of the drinks that contain one unit of alcohol. The general advice regarding alcohol consumption is that men should drink less than 21 units per week and women should drink less than 14 units per week. There should be at least two alcohol-free days every week and during pregnancy drinking should be avoided. Binge drinking should also be avoided. Binge drinking refers to consuming more than eight units in the case of men and more than six units in the case of women within a single day. Different professional organizations give different advices and the same professional organization also keeps updating its advice. But the information given in this slide is generally correct. There are different terms that are used in this field, alcoholism, alcohol abuse, alcohol addiction, alcohol misuse, 
at risk drinking dipsomania problem drinking for the purpose of this lecture i am going to use the term alcohol misuse in this slide i have summarized the main psychiatric consequences of alcohol misuse alcohol is associated with a range of psychiatric disorders in some patients alcohol may be the primary cause of psychiatric symptoms so for example depression or cognitive impairment so unless you address the alcohol issue the symptoms will persist so this might explain some cases of uh, patients with depression who are not responding to antidepressants so unless you take an alcohol history and address that issue the depression will remain unresolved in some patients the patient may use alcohol in order to cope with the symptoms for example patients with ptsd uh, might experience uh, severe anxiety nightmares flashbacks etc so they might self medicate using alcohol in others alcohol misuse and the psychiatric disorder may occur concurrently for example heavy alcohol use may be seen in some personality disorders such as borderline personality disorder or uh, drunken driving and binge drinking may occur as part of an antisocial personality disorder and psychiatric symptoms can occur during the whole range of alcohol misuse disorders whether it is intoxication dependence or withdrawal usually patients who are intoxicated uh, don't come to the attention of uh, routine psychiatric services because they are dealt with either by the police or by emergency services whereas dependence and withdrawal are disorders that uh, a psychiatrist would need to be familiar with and alcohol misuse is a very important risk factor for suicide In this slide I have listed some of the alcohol related disorders featured in ICD-10. And in this lecture I'll be focusing on dependence syndrome, withdrawal syndrome, and amnesic syndrome which is part of the wernicke korsakoff syndrome alcohol use disorders or aud is a term that is used in dsm-5 in dsm-4 alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence were distinct disorders with dependence being a more severe entity than abuse in dsm-5 AUD encompasses both into a single diagnosis and AUD is subdivided into mild moderate or severe based on the presence of uh, the number of criteria and craving is one of the 11 criteria in DSM-5 uh, this was not included in DSM-4 and in the next two slides i'll be listing the 11 criteria of aud in dsm-5 if you are interested you can pause and note down the points
we now move on to alcohol dependence syndrome. In this slide, I have listed the ICD-10 criteria for alcohol dependence syndrome. Tolerance and withdrawal are important features of dependence. Tolerance refers to a significantly reduced effect while using the same amount of alcohol or a need to significantly increase the amount of alcohol to achieve the same effect as obtained previously. And withdrawal is characterized by Symptoms that occur while suddenly reducing or stopping alcohol after prolonged use. And the symptoms are resolved by consuming alcohol. We will now look at the neurobiology of alcohol dependence. Alcohol stimulates the release of endorphins and it also stimulates the release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area into the nucleus accumbens. So this mesolimbic dopamine pathway is part of the brain's pleasure motivation reward system. As a result, the drinking behavior gets associated with pleasure and gets reinforced. Mu opioid receptors appear to play a role in craving. During the initial stages of alcohol use, alcohol stimulates GABA neurotransmission and inhibits glutamate neurotransmission. So the net result is inhibition. With chronic usage, there is varied effects because of receptor upregulation, downregulation, etc. And generally, there is a net reduction in GABA A receptors and a net increase in NMDA glutamate receptors. Withdrawal symptoms can be explained by the central nervous system becoming acutely hyperactive due to the sudden absence of alcohol's inhibitory effects to which the body has become used to. Serotonin may also play a role in reinforcing the drinking behavior. During acute intoxication, there is increased serotonin activity. In dependence, there is reduced serotonin activity, which may contribute towards craving. In addition, numerous other factors such as CRF, neuropeptide Y, etc. may be relevant in alcohol misuse. Family history of alcoholism is an important risk factor. This supports the role of genetic factors. Numerous polymorphisms have been associated with alcohol misuse and I have listed a few of those. Age of onset of heavy drinking is earlier in those with a genetic predisposition compared to those in whom alcohol misuse occurs in the context of uh, psychosocial risk factors. In the assessment of alcohol misuse, for screening, CAGE questionnaire is widely used. And for assessing the severity of alcohol misuse, the audit questionnaire can be used. And for making a diagnosis of alcohol dependence, the ICD-10 criteria 
or the DSM-5 criteria or the Edwards and Gross criteria are used. You have already seen the ICD-10 and DSM-5 criteria. The CAGE questionnaire is useful for screening, especially in primary care. And CAGE is an acronym derived from the wording of the four questions. And I've listed the four questions. Further assessment is warranted if the patient answers yes to two or more questions. Audit stands for Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. This is more detailed than the CAGE. There are 10 questions with each being scored on a scale of 0 to 4. So the maximum score is 40. A score of more than 8 suggests alcohol misuse. And the first three questions called Audit C because these are questions relating to actual consumption of alcohol, they can be used for screening. Asking all the 10 questions is called the full audit and this helps to quantify the severity of alcohol misuse based on the score. The Edwards and Gross criteria were developed in 1976 and I have listed these criteria on this slide. And these criteria have been highly influential in this field and they were also the broad basis for the ICD-10 criteria for alcohol dependence. There are certain blood test results which can support a diagnosis of alcohol misuse, raised MCV or macrocytosis, raised GGT which is a liver enzyme and raised ALT and AST, these are also liver enzymes, raised CDT or carbohydrate deficient transferrin. Out of these, CDT has the highest sensitivity and specificity, but may not be readily available in many labs. We will now look at the management of alcohol dependence. As this is a very detailed topic, I will just be attempting to give an overview. So the management can be divided into non-pharmacological, pharmacological and others. And I have listed the main intervention in each. So motivational in interviewing, which is a non-pharmacological strategy. And the three drugs which are most commonly used, pharmacological agents and non-professional intervention, which is Alcoholics Anonymous. Motivational interviewing is a brief treatment developed by clinical psychologists David Miller and Stephen Rolnick. There is a substantial evidence base for its effectiveness in alcohol misuse disorders. And the three components of motivation are readiness, willingness and ability. Motivational interviewing helps patients to deal with their ambivalence about making changes. 
and motivational interviewing values the autonomy of clients to make their own decisions. According to Miller, motivational interviewing is a person-centered, goal-oriented method of communication for eliciting and strengthening intrinsic motivation for positive change. It is not a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. It is not a panacea for every clinical challenge. And it is not a way of tricking people into doing what you want them to do. MI has been influenced by the stages of change model of Prochaska and De Clement. And this is that model. So patients can be at any stage of change. So it's pre-contemplation, contemplation, determination or preparation, action, relapse and maintenance. And this slide gives some more information about each of those stages. There are some techniques that are used in motivational interviewing and the acronym ORS is useful to remember them. Open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening and summarizing. We now move on to the pharmacological management. We will be covering three drugs, disulfiram, acamprosate and naltrexone. Disulfiram is an aversive agent. It acts by inhibiting aldehyde dehydrogenase. So this leads to accumulation of acetaldehyde which causes physical symptoms when the patient consumes alcohol. I have mentioned some of the key points about disulfiram. I am not going to go through each point. Those who are interested can pause and note down the details. Uh, it is very important that patient should not consume alcohol when they are using disulfiram. So if any alcohol was taken, at least 24 hours should pass before taking disulfiram. And similarly, after the patient stops disulfiram, no alcohol should be taken for two weeks. And the patient should also be warned about potential presence of alcohol in food, perfumes, medicines, etc. The next drug is acamprosate and I have listed the key points of this drug. Those who are interested can pause and note down the details. And while using acamprosate, even if the patient consumes alcohol, uh, there is no physical risk. And for patients who seem to be responding to acamprosate, Maintenance treatment for one year is recommended. And naltrexone is an opiate receptor antagonist. And I have listed the key points of naltrexone on this slide. And those who are interested can pause and note down the details. Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by Bill Wilson and Bob Smith in 1935 in the US. It's a mutual fellowship program for people with alcoholism. And it uses a 12-step program of spiritual and character development. This is now available in uh, many countries 
The Main Guide is a book published in 1939 originally and informally called as the Big Book. And AA has inspired organizations like Narcotics Anonymous, uh, which helps people with uh, problems with uh, illicit substance misuse. And this is the logo of AA. And these are the 12 steps. Those who are interested can pause and note down the details. We now move on to alcohol withdrawal syndrome. This occurs in a person who suddenly stops, reduces or delays drinking after a prolonged period of regular and heavy alcohol use. This syndrome can be explained by the central nervous system becoming acutely hyperactive due to the sudden absence of alcohol's inhibitory effects. A past history of withdrawal syndrome significantly increases the future risk of withdrawal syndrome in the same patient. The withdrawal symptoms usually start within six hours of the last drink and usually resolve within 48 hours. What are the common signs and symptoms of alcohol withdrawal syndrome? Tremors, sweating, insomnia, nausea and vomiting, anxiety, restlessness, agitation, palpitations and tachycardia, headache, hallucinations or illusions which can be visual, auditory, tactile, etc. And convulsions in the form of grand mal seizures can also occur. Delirium tremens or DT is a specific type of delirium that occurs as part of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Along with other features of any delirium such as clouding of consciousness, disorientation, inattention etc. DT is characterized by autonomic instability mainly sympathetic overactivity. So tremors as the name indicates, tachycardia, hypertension, sweating, etc. DT usually occurs within 48 hours of withdrawal but can occasionally occur even up to a week later. There is a suggestion that DT may be more common in whites than in blacks and DT is a medical emergency with a significant mortality. What are the risk factors for DT? A past history of DT, a past history of withdrawal seizures, medical comorbidities such as infections, hypokalemia, head injury, severe withdrawal symptoms during the current episode of withdrawal, older age, history of heavy alcohol use for more than 10 years, Assessment plays a very important role in the management of alcohol withdrawal syndrome. A comprehensive history of alcohol use should be taken. Try and establish the accurate time of the last drink. Do a thorough physical examination. Assess the severity of withdrawal symptoms. If possible, you can use a scale 
which can give you a scoring. Do the relevant blood tests and other investigations. Monitor vital signs frequently. In this slide, I have highlighted the main aspects of treating alcohol withdrawal syndrome. Benzodiazepines are the mainstay of treatment. In addition to symptom relief, they also protect against seizures and DT. Patients with prominent risk factors will need inpatient detoxification. Patients with no major risk factors and with a reliable 24-hour carer can be managed in the community. A relatively long-acting benzodiazepine such as chlordiazepoxide, trade name Librium, or diazepam, trade name Valium, is usually used. The initial dose depends on the severity of withdrawal symptoms. The dose is gradually reduced and typically stopped within 7 to 10 days. Thiamine is advisable for prophylaxis against Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Delirium tremens should be managed in an ICU or general medical ward. It is important to identify and correct fluid and electrolyte abnormalities. Identify and treat underlying comorbid infections or other medical illnesses. Parental thiamine should be, should be administered before any glucose or dextrose is administered to reduce the risk of precipitating Wernicke's encephalopathy. Benzodiazepines are the mainstay of treatment. In acute DT, the benzodiazepine may have to be given IM or IV. As soon as practical, change to oral formulation. For acute agitation, a short-acting benzodiazepine like lorazepam may be useful. Antipsychotics can lower seizure threshold and should be only used if absolutely needed. Patients with severe DT may need heavy sedation, intubation, mechanical ventilation, etc. in an ICU. We now move on to Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Actually, this consists of two distinct but related syndromes. Wernicke's encephalopathy is the acute phenomenon and the chronic state is Korsakoff syndrome, also called Korsakoff psychosis or amnestic syndrome or amnesic confabulatory syndrome. And even the name Korsakoff is spelt differently in different textbooks. Wernicke's encephalopathy was first described by the German physician Karl Wernicke. The Wernicke speech area is also named after him. Korsakoff syndrome was first described by the Russian neuropsychiatrist Sergei Korsakoff. Many cases of Wernicke's encephalopathy might not progress to Korsakoff syndrome. Similarly, not all cases of Korsakoff syndrome are preceded by a clear history of Wernicke's. This is Karl Wernicke and Sergei Korsakoff. The underlying etiology for this syndrome is time and deficiency of which chronic alcoholism is the most common and best studied cause. There are a lot of other potential causes which I have listed. Time and plays an important role in axonal conduction. 
severe thiamine deficiency can lead to neuronal death. The classical features of Wernicke's encephalopathy are confusion, ataxia, and nystagmus. Well, the classical features of Korsakoff syndrome are an inability to learn or store, store new information and confabulation. So confabulation refers to the patient filling gaps in memory with incorrect information. But this is not a deliberate lying on the part of the patient. High dose parenteral thiamine, usually for 3 to 7 days, depending on the initial response, may successfully reverse symptoms of Wernicke's encephalopathy. If it is untreated, there is a high risk of progression to Korsakoff syndrome, though that does not occur in every patient. Korsakoff syndrome symptoms are usually resistant to treatment. However, maintenance high dose oral thiamine in addition to abstinence from alcohol may be beneficial for some patients. Unless it is a life threatening hypoglycemia, as mentioned earlier, glucose or dextrose should not be administered prior to thiamine as it can precipitate Wernicke's encephalopathy. Before we conclude, we will go through five MCQs. Question 1. How many units of alcohol are contained in one liter of an alcoholic drink with ABV of 10%? If you want, you can pause and select your choice. The correct answer is option B, 10 units. This is the formula for calculating the number of units. And 1 liter is 1000 ml. So the answer is 10. Question 2. Which of the following is true regarding thiamine replacement in patients with alcohol misuse disorders? If you want, you can pause and select your choice. And the correct answer is Option 3. Thiamine should be given before glucose to reduce the risk of Wernicke's encephalopathy. Question 3. Which of the following blood test results does not suggest alcohol misuse? If you want, you can pause and select your choice. And the correct answer is option A. Microcytosis. In alcohol misuse, you would expect macrocytosis or an increase in mean corpuscular volume. Question 4. Which of the following is not a technique typically used in motivational interviewing? You can pause, go through the options and select one. And the correct answer is option C. So this is not a technique. Asking open-ended questions is used in motivational interviewing. And the final question, which of the following applies to a camprosate? You can pause and select your choice and the correct answer is option D. Concomitant alcohol use is not contraindicated in a patient receiving a camprosate. Option A is incorrect because that applies to disulfiram. Option B is incorrect because that applies to naltrexone. Option C is incorrect because you would recommend maintenance treatment for one year. And the treatment that lasts 7 to 10 days applies to 
an alcohol detoxification regime to prevent withdrawal symptoms. And that brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you for watching and hope you found the lecture useful.